in 2013, we made a concerted effort to focus on sour water stripping to improve our analytical capability, our testing capability, our simulation capability, and our troubleshooting capability. Well, I tell you what, folks, we just completed our 50th troubleshooting job of sour water stripper fouling, identifying the root cause and the prevention. So in honor of our 10 year anniversary of sour water stripper troubleshooting, we're gonna do a video on the causes we saw of sour water stripper fouling and how to prevent it. So stay tuned for this very special, exciting topic. Welcome to the Experts Network. Experts Network. My name is Ben Spooner. I am an engineer with Amy and Experts, and today's topic is on the fouling of sour water strippers. It's a very common problem in the refining industry, something we've been dealing a lot with these past five to ten years. And when we foul the stripper, a lot of bad things happen. We basically can't process as much water through the stripper as we would like, and it kind of backs up the sour water through the refinery. When we can't dispose of the sour water, we have to cut back on how much of it we're making, and so there's a lot of economic consequences to a foul sour water stripper. So in this video, we're gonna talk about the main reasons that we see that cause fouling and some tips and tricks as to what you can do to prevent fouling or at least delay it from occurring. So, what sour water is, is water that contains toxic, smelly contaminants. And we wanna get rid of it so that then the water can go to the wastewater treatment plant and not wreck the wastewater treatment plant. The main two specifications sour water has to meet is on H2S and ammonia. So those are the two main components we wanna get out of the water. Now, when those two things are present in a liquid form, they're usually either there as ions or as a salt reacted with each other. And neither of those have a vapor pressure. So you can't just get rid of ammonium bisulfide, say, out of water by whatever, shaking it or depressurizing it. You have to heat it up. You have to cause a little bit of chemical reaction, create those thermodynamic conditions necessary for what was a salt to become the individual ingredients that made it up in the first place, which is H2S and ammonia. Those two do have a vapor pressure. Those can be stripped out of the liquid phase into the vapor phase. So that's what sour water stripping is. It's when we heat everything up. Now, when we drive H2S and ammonia out of the water, it changes the pH of the water. And so that combination of an increase in temperature and a change in pH, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards, depends on the stripper, but that can cause a lot of other chemical reactions to occur inside that stripper as well. And that's often what leads to fouling. So let's kind of go through this one step at a time. Step one of a sour water stripper fouling troubleshooting job is you need to identify where the fouling originated because this oftentimes can lead you uh, down the path that you want to go as to what caused the fouling. So for example, fouling in the upper part of the stripper is oftentimes caused by ammonium salts. So ammonia, which is a strong base, reacts with pretty much anything acidic, most commonly H2S or CO2. If we cool the liquid down, those salts precipitate and it's kind of like pouring concrete inside the pipes or your overhead condenser. So the cool areas of the plant are where we're at most risk of ammonium salts. Now there are other salts that may be present in the water, salts containing calcium or magnesium. Those tend to stay until we start boiling off the water. And the calcium and magnesium don't boil with the water, they form more of a scale, and those can often wind up fouling the bottom, the hottest part of the stripper, especially inside the reboiler or reboiler tube. So we really don't want water containing calcium or magnesium at all entering our stripper. They lead to fouling of the reboiler. Another thing that can cause fouling is sulfur. Ugh. You know, you don't normally just put sulfur into the sour water stripper, it forms. It forms from the decomposition of usually either ammonium polysulfide or sulfuric acid. 
ammonium polysulfide sometimes used for hydrogen, or uh, sorry, hydrogen cyanide control, and sulfuric acid sometimes used as a pH adjustment. It's the wrong acid to use for pH adjustment. Use citric acid, use phosphoric acid, use something that doesn't decompose into sulfur. This normally happens in the lower part of the stripper at the very high temperature, and it's combined with low pH. Sulfur fouling, although it happens, not super common. Far more common are, is particulate related fouling, just simple suspended solids in the water. Now, if the water itself is very, very dirty, that's gonna cause fouling right where the water enters the stripper. Because going through the pipes, the water is flowing very quickly, but into the stripper where we open up in diameter, the flow rate of the water slows down, and so these solids can precipitate out. Normally, really black, sludgy water going into a stripper means we have a very dirty, fouled water holding tank where the water is coming from. So a lot of times, it's pretty difficult to remove the, or prevent the solids from the water when we have a really sludgy holding tank. More on this in a bit. Um, the other place where particulates can really cause problems is if they mix with hydrocarbons. Okay, the combination of hydrocarbons in the water plus solids is very, very bad. And that's where we're gonna get fouling kind of in the middle, sort of anywhere between the top and the bottom of the tower. The middle section, fouling there, like say like tray like 14, would be from a combination of hydrocarbons that have generally polymerized and increased in viscosity plus particulates. So we look at where the fouling happened, at top, middle, or bottom, and that's gonna give us clues as to where to start, uh, begin our troubleshooting efforts. Now, when it comes to that overhead, those ammonium salts, th that's a pretty easy one to prevent fouling because temperature, high temperature, will prevent the salts from precipitating out. So a sour water acid gas line, or swag we generally call it, needs to be kept at around 185 degrees Fahrenheit or 85 Celsius all the way to the sulfur plant. So we need to look at what the temperature is at the sulfur plant. We want that at around that 185F or 85C. Now, if you have temperature drop across the line, because maybe it's not that well insulated or steam trace, that means we might, we might need to be even hotter leaving the sour water stripper. So pay attention to that. We don't want fouling across that line. It's tough to unfoul a big long pipeline. You just gotta hit it really, really hard with steam. So pay attention to your sour water acid gas temperature and make sure it's properly insulated. Next, we're gonna focus on particulates and then their combination with hydrocarbons. But when you sample the water, like in this picture, you get this black water, all right? But when we set the sample down, and give it an hour or two, you can see all the solids did sink to the bottom and you're left with a clear bottle of water with solids on the bottom. Those solids were entrained with the water. So again, it probably means it's coming from a very dirty separator tank. And obviously if you could, you would just clean the separator tank, prevent this problem. Um, if that's not a realistic option, then we will instead focus on putting a filter on that water which is something we'll talk about in just, uh, in just a bit later on in this video. Now, the way to determine where the solids are coming from is probably the best technique to prevent the solid ingress into the stripper. Um, sample the individual water streams, find out which are the dirtiest ones. Usually it's only three or four streams maybe that are causing 95% of the problem. Now, when you're sampling sour water looking for solids, you've got to be a little bit careful because a lot of the chemicals in sour water are very reactive with oxygen. So you want to remove the solids from the water before oxygen touches them. So you use a system like this where the water flows through a filter and then into the sample collection bucket, which is you basically just dispose of the sample. What you're looking for is the solids. And so in this apparatus, like we show here, we have a filter paper inside of that membrane. We call it gravimetric sampling or grav samples. And you get a little filter paper with solids. From there, we can analyze those solids, figure out what they are, maybe what's causing them, and go to the root cause and prevent them from getting into the water in the first place. Very useful form of sampling and analysis when we have particulate ingress in our water. Now, what those fouling contaminants are going to be is usually some kind of corrosion product, like an iron-based corrosion product, 
or a lot of times coke. If you have a coker in your refinery, that coke dust, which as you know, gets everywhere, can get into the water and it creates a lot of uh, fouling potential in the sour water stripper. Uh, when we get buildup of these particulates in the stripper, they don't really hold temperature. They're kind of cold areas. And again, that's where salts will precipitate. If we have salts in the water, they're gonna to wanna to cling to these solids. They're gonna to wanna to go to the low temperature areas. So they're a catalyst for salt precipitation, which causes that lump of solids to grow even larger inside the stripper. So you don't want buildup of solids in the stripper. And they're especially bad when we combine with hydrocarbons. So for example, uh, this is uh, the internals of the stripper make a big difference as to how prone the stripper is to fouling. Here we have a packed sour water stripper full of what we call black shoe polish. It's a combination of hydrocarbons and suspended solids. The hydrocarbons are of high viscosity, the solids stick to that, and then the salts from the water start precipitating out into there. Honestly, you guys, we don't recommend packing usage in sour water strippers at all. It's a really risky choice of internals. When everything's clean, yes, they are a little bit more efficient. You can put more water through, more steam through a clean packed tower, but they rarely stay clean for long. You're better off choosing a type of internal that's more resistant to fouling, like Coke Glitch Pro valves or Salzer V Grid. You know, these a lot of these tray vendors create valves where the water kind of flows over ramps. And even if they're solids in the water, they just flow over the ramps and over into the downcomer. Now you can still have fouling of the downcomer, but that takes a lot longer to become a problem. What we don't get is fouling of the trays. You don't see the high differential pressure across the tower and the trays tend to last a lot longer before we run into any serious operational issues. Uh, as I mentioned, worse is if we combine solids with hydrocarbons. Solid ingress with hydrocarbons is brutal, and the heavier the hydrocarbon, the worse the fouling is gonna get. Like you see in this video, this was just a feed sour water sample into a stripper we recently tested. Ugh, look at that stuff. You see how the solids cling to the hydrocarbons? You shake it up and they right away just go right back to the top. Now ideally, this sort of thing would have been separated out of the water in the upstream flash tank or sour water holding tank. So obviously our main focus needs to be on those tanks and ask the tanks, why did you let these hydrocarbons do? Something went wrong there. But until you figure that out, this is what's going into the stripper. Now, in the stripper, as we get rid of the H2S, which happens first, the pH goes up. And in the bottom part of the stripper, we then get rid of the ammonia, the pH is gonna go back down. So we tend to get, you, you tend to see these kind of changes in pH. Um, it's stripper specific as to what that pH is gonna do, but luckily using a simulator, good simulators now can model what the pH is gonna do tray by tray. So once we know where the fouling has occurred, we then tend to put it side by side with a chart of the pH of the water, and it starts to help things make a little bit more sense. So using a simulator in conjunction with analytical techniques is a really powerful way of troubleshooting uh, fouling. Okay, as I mentioned, hydrocarbons really shouldn't be getting through the flash tank or the uh, water holding tank. So let's break down the flash tank a little bit. We have two things we can do. One, lower the pressure as much as possible, and that's gonna allow hydrocarbons to vaporize rather than remain in liquid form. But yes, you may be able to skim them if you have enough resonance time, but a problem we've seen in a lot of refineries over the years is we've increased the water going to the sour water stripper system, but we haven't increased the size of the flash tank or the stripper itself. So residence time has gone down, which means hydrocarbons go right through the flash tank. So one thing we can do when we're sampling those individual streams feeding the flash tank is make sure they're actually sour in the first place. We've generally found between 10 to 30% of the water going into a sour water stripper system isn't even sour. It can go straight to wastewater, wastewater treatment and uh, give us a lot more residence time in the flash tank. 
Next, we have the holding tank. So after the flash tank, the Sarah water holding tank, kind of two big things here. Again, residence time. So the bigger the tank, the better. Run it at about half full. You do want space for in case there's a you know, downstream upset. We need to store water for a while, but you run it at about half full and be careful. What's floating on top of that water is nasty. Don't let the tank level drop too low or you'll suck all that nastiness into the sour water stripper. Now you immediately get fouling, not much you can do. So control the level and have as big a tank as possible. You really want to focus on the water leaving that tank because that's what's going to the stripper. Analyze that stuff. So there's a couple of different ways of doing it. What we prefer is to use a combination of a particle filter followed by a coalescing filter. And these are portable little filters we put up on tripods and you just put a slipstream of water through for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. You know, whatever it takes to get a good decent sample of the contamination in the water. What you're gonna normally get if hydrocarbons were a problem in the first place is we wind up getting a bottle of those concentrated hydrocarbons. And then we can do some good test work on it. The first test we do, demulsifier. Okay, you can see what we have here. There's three vials showing. Um, one vial has no demulsifier, so it's just that, that contaminant we pulled out of the water, added right back into the water, we shake it up. Beside it is the exact same test, but with different demulsifiers added. And then you tie, you shake them all at once, put them down, and you see how quickly it takes for those hydrocarbons to separate. When you find the right demulsifier, the hydrocarbons will separate out of the water in seconds, minutes, okay? Without the demulsifier, sometimes it takes a lot longer. So these demulsifiers are a very powerful tool to increase the efficiency of your separation tank. Get rid of the hydrocarbons in the tank, don't let them go with the water. And if all else fails, then, you put a filter on the water. This is definitely a growing trend in the refining industry. Normally you put a particle filter first, followed by a coalescer that's gonna remove all solids, all hydrocarbons out of the water. Kind of like what you see in a lot of amine plants. Uh, works great, but pretty nasty to change those filters out. So there's a lot of design and safety considerations done around purging the filter before you open it, otherwise the whole refinery is gonna reek of ammonia, you gotta be very careful that way, but it does work. Okay, in conclusion, to try to keep these videos kind of short, um, preventing or delaying fouling, you can sample the individual water streams and target the most contaminated ones, just clean up those, those couple streams, sometimes makes a huge difference, that's quick and easy. Um, if you can, reduce the water flow through the flash tank and holding tank, and you do that by measuring which streams do not have H2S. They can be routed right to, right to wastewater. Uh, reduce the flash tank pressure if we can to try to flash off more hydrocarbons. Don't let the holding tank level get too low. We don't want that rag layer, that scum layer to go with the sour water. Uh, use a demulsifier to increase rate of separation. Install a filter on the sour water feed and as far as the sour water internals go use fouling resistant trays that is fouling in a sour water stripper in a nutshell you guys thank you very much for joining us here on our youtube channel please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss when we have the time to put these videos together thank you very much for your support and we'll see you next time inside your piping or condenser tubes and um what the? I'm just trying to do my job. If there's anything else I can help you with, let me know. Siri.